this is probably the first time we are going through what I actually like to call it as COVID of tech. Winter is coming and unfortunately so is the recession. 70% of the weight right, of a decision making process for an employee to stay or leave company comes from whether they are feeling cared by their line manager or not. We must be a data-driven business unit where we demonstrate what is our value to the business, right? Versus what is our cost to the business. The layoffs not only does a certain level of reputational and brand damage, but it really impacts the psychology of existing employees as well. As we begin, I think I set some context for everybody. Winter is coming. And unfortunately, so is the recession. Companies are reimagining ways to sail through this downturn. And we've seen two alarming trends all over the globe. Number one is that 90% CEOs believe that a downturn is coming. And this was a survey done on 400 American CEOs by KPMG just this year itself. And number two is within this year itself, in 2022 alone, 850 companies have laid off more than 130,000 employees all over the globe. And this is an alarming time for all of us. But at, at a time where recession is concerning most of these companies, psychological safety and retention of employees is number one priority. And as you saw on the topic, we would go on to say retention is the new recruiting. So let's dive right in. I am super excited to introduce you to a diverse panel we have today, which is Vikas and Sergio. And let's start off with Vikas. Uh, Vikas is the country manager at Quest Singapore. Uh, it's in the top two largest IT staffing firms in Singapore. The organization size is roughly 1,500 employees. He's a graduate from National University of Singapore with more than 18 years of experience and handles a complete PNL responsibility of more than 120 million Singapore dollars. And my favorite bit now is Vikas's personal passion is astrology. So thank you, Vikas, for making time today. Thank you for having me. We now have Sergio as well. And that's where it gets interesting because Vikas is a country manager, but Sergio is a chief people officer. Sergio works at Carsum. Carsum is Southeast Asia's leading car e-commerce platform. Um, the organization size is 5,000 employees. And Sergio is a Stanford grad with more than 25 years of experience. Uh, in companies like Electronic Arts, Nokia, Yahoo, Google, and his personal passion is sailing. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for making it today, Sergio. Thanks for the introduction. Thank you very much for inviting me. Very excited to be here. So Sergio, uh, given you're in Southeast Asia and like US being a separate market, are you seeing an impact of the recession uh, in Southeast Asia and Singapore and uh, like, what's your uh, take on what's going on right now? I doubt that there is any particular region in the world or group of companies or industry that is not feeling the effects of, of those massive waves by starting in the US market. There's uncertainty that makes it difficult for leadership teams to make business decisions. It disrupts strategies, right? But at heart, I'm a little bit of an optimist. And I like to, to think that um, any, any time of disruption is a good opportunity. You, uh, you gave us a quote earlier, I think before we connected, from popular culture, you said winter is coming, right? <laughs> another, another quote from the same show or books, if you prefer, is chaos isn't a pit, chaos is a ladder. And therefore, I believe that whenever there is disruption, there is also many, many opportunities, right? Having to go through tough times can make companies and individuals more resilient. And uh, while I see that organizations are being negatively impacted, I also see a lot of creativity and many organizations figuring out what are the next steps and making the most of the circumstances, right? Um, this comes from my time at Google, but uh, at least in those years, we wanted to believe that you have to disrupt yourself continuously before the market conditions or something else or another company competitor disrupts you. So Vikas, you yourself, despite being a business leader, have spent 18 years in the recruitment space, right? So given that context, what's your take on what's going on uh, in, in at least in the Southeast Asia market with regards to the recession and the slowdown? Well, we can't catch a break, can we? First, it was COVID. And just when we thought we were coming out of COVID, you know, things were getting normal. You know, war has been thrust upon us. Now you've got a cost of living crisis. And so we are, yes, staring at an economic slowdown. But I think my take is a little bit different, though, here. Talk of recession has basically come to the headline because of essentially the layoffs that we have seen in the tech industry for the past four or five months, right? They, they have sort of grabbed the headline. 
And since I happen to work for a company that does significant amount of sort of business through our IT staffing, I think I can perhaps speak as an insider. So the world of tech, in fact, really saw no slowdown when the world came to a halt during COVID, right? The tech in many ways was actually an outlier. So in many ways, this is probably the first time we are going through what I actually like to call it as COVID of tech. In fact, it's an Omicron wave of tech COVID, right? Mild, but fairly widespread. Yeah. But to me, right, it is more of a market correction uh, than a real slowdown, right? And particularly from the vantage point of tech. I mean, forget Twitter, because I think that's, again, an aberration, right? If you compare the Microsofts, the Metas of the world, the Coinbase, the Amazon, look at their current employee base after the layoffs and compare it with what they had in 2018 and 2019, right? Just before COVID. Almost each one of them still have more employees than they had. They just ended up building a massive amount of capacity. We are experiencing a slowdown because we are comparing our current demand environment with what we saw in last two to three years, because we simply got used to the frantic pace with which the technology was being consumed. Two days ago, during a parliamentary debate in Singapore, uh, it was presented that about 70% of the retrenchment that have actually happened in Singapore have happened to those possessing non-tech skill sets. So that means that there's still a demand for tech. Yeah. It's just that, yes, the demand from the, the tech companies have normalized. Interesting. That's a very unique perspective. And a question I have for both of you is, how is this impacting you, right? Like as people leaders or your people leaders in the company, like what are the challenges you're facing as a result of this right now? So I guess there are two possible answers to that, right? One of them is at a very personal level. And uh, one thing is that uh, we're all human at the end of the day, right? And whatever happens out there, the ups and downs in the economy, the ups and downs in level of soft energy, the ups and downs in, in potential outlook, right? Uh, the positivity or negativity does have an effect on everyone, uh, including myself. Um, and that conversation reminds me of the fact that as a people leader, right? And, and I'm very lucky to be leading 100 amazing HR professionals in this company. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that all of us have two levels of responsibility. We have a level of responsibility towards 5,000 people in the company. We have to take care of them and provide them with the best possible employee experience. But at the same time, we also have to put that kind of oxygen mask on ourselves first and make sure that we can manage our own emotions and our own levels of energy, right? and certainly that includes myself, same as all the others, in order to be able to help others. Right? Uh, it's difficult to help others if you're not feeling uh, very well yourself. Um, I think also uh, we were discussing the other day, right, the concepts of psychological safety and, and ensuring that we can create the right atmosphere uh, for people to be vulnerable, to feel like they can express their opinions without the fear of being judged or humiliated. Interesting. In fact, like last year, I remember reading that 98% of HR professionals themselves are facing burnout, let alone solving for burnout for their own employees. So people professionals, as you like to say, Sergio. So but perhaps what are the top two, three challenges you've seen, at least in the Southeast Asia market for people leaders in specific? I think one of the errors most companies did was that we, you know, we all assumed that this boom, particularly the tech boom, right, will continue. And therefore, we just continued building capacity into the system. Now, the excess capacity was really built without looking at the right composition of your workforce mix, without thinking through sort of what skills were core to your business and what skills sort of you should leave maybe to, you know, to an outside expert, an outside outsource supplier, right? Companies found it much easier to just increase salaries and hire aggressively rather than working hard on the culture and the great employee experience. So the challenge now with all the leaders in the current context is that we build this extra capacity. Uh, now, what do we do with them, right? Now that the demand is actually slowing down. Of course, many organizations have taken the call to lay off and, 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 you know, they are obviously giving severance packages and perhaps also taking helps of the outplacement organizations. But the fact is that many of these people who are being let go were just hired about six to eight months ago, right? And the layoffs not only uh, does a certain level of reputational and brand damage, but it really impacts the psychology of existing employees as well, right? It makes them insecure, and it, in fact, it affects their productivity as well. Unfortunately, this, these same companies are going to find it difficult attracting talents, right? Because employees will now, I think, prefer to stay and perhaps value those companies who were prudent 
in their cost expenses and really pay attention to the overall employee experience. Sergio, like as you add on an, addi- an additional question I have for you is, Vikas mentioned psychological safety again, right? So not only the challenges, but how are you addressing psychological safety? Irrespective of the current circumstances, I think psychological safety is an ongoing project, an ongoing work for them, right? And most importantly, no one can create psychological safety. The role of people leaders like myself is to actually create the right conditions for people to feel like they can be open, transparent, right? And share knowing that they're not going to be judged. Um, So irrespective of the fact that we seem to see a lot of things going on in the market, the work of creating the right conditions for psychological safety has not changed. If anything, we probably have to spend even more time uh, driving this kind of of tactics or strategies. If a business leader is himself or herself disengaged, obviously it's going to be quite difficult for the team to also feel engaged. Ensuring that the team understands right, that they can be open by being open yourself. We're all human, right? We all have our up days and our down days. So showing that right, uh, also creates psychological safety. Um, addressing negativity, nipping it in the bud, uh, not necessarily avoiding healthy conflict, but ensuring that negativity doesn't seep in, right? Including teams in decision-making, for example, be open to feedback. But is, there's no magic formula here. Right. Ultimately, it's about being human and recognizing that other people are human and showing empathy. I was reading recently uh, the latest report from Gartner. Right? Um, I'm not getting a commission for this, but very interesting report on the top five priorities for HR leader uh, leaders next year. And I'm just going to name them because they actually resonate a lot with, with me. Number one is the leader and manager effectiveness, i.e. providing more development opportunities for leaders and managers increase their quality and their ability to lead lead businesses and lead people. Number two, organizational design and change management. Number three, um, employee experience. Number four, retention. Interestingly enough, employee experience goes ahead, uh, goes before retention. The premise is taking care of our people means that they can take care of the business. And showing empathy is going to create the right conditions for a high-performing organization where pe- people feel safe and happy. Got it. And Sergio, a question for you. Do you think people leaders have that voice, that say in their companies to make that influence? If not, how do you suggest they can amplify their voice? And Sergio, as a people leader, I would love to have you go first. I think for me, people leaders in general, people operations leaders have an opportunity to uh, uh, reinvent themselves and think of themselves as business leaders. Hmm? Uh, they need to have an understanding that they need to have a seat at the table right, of the decision-making process and that a people function right, is not different from any other business unit. Personally, this is how I lead my team. Right? My message to them is that we must be a data-driven business unit where we demonstrate what is our value to the, to the business right, versus what is our cost to the business. And a lot of the, a lot of the other the tactics, I believe, flow from there. It's imperative right, that uh, traditional HR leaders rebrand themselves as business leaders um, and act accordingly. Traditional HR leaders to brand themselves as business leaders. I think that's a takeaway. And Vikas, being a business leader yourself, what's your take on people leaders having a say? Yeah, absolutely. I think Sergio made a great point and I'm actually a personal believer in that. And that I think data plays a great role in, you know, in being able to amplify your voice. Um, surely it's a, you know, it's, it's part of the culture as well. And this is what culture is about. You give enough empowerment and voice to the level one and the level two managers as well, you know, who are able to uh, socialize some of these ideas with their senior managers and top managers if they feel that some of these retention strategies right, is going to make their impact. Yeah. So my advice to all of these level one, level two managers would be is that Pack your arguments with a lot of data, statistics, and empirical evidence, and then try to present it to your managers. By the way, in today's environment, we are hungry for ideas, right? Because <laughs> we are hungry for ideas. We are hungry as to, because problems is not one, right? I mean, I wish the problem statement was just about revenue growth and profitability growth. The problems are many in today's environment. So we would love for anyone to come and give us advice, right? And give us concrete suggestions that can that we can build into the business. How do you get the business to buy on retaining rather than excess hiring as they usually hold on to the purse string for the hiring? So sometimes they feel it's easier to hire new talent than to upscale or retain or shape existing talent. I think uh, um, trade-offs 
are always going to be a business imperative, and that includes trade-offs in bringing new people versus upskilling existing people. For me, both um, strategies are actually compatible, right? and they need to work and coexist with each other, um, because that gives uh, HR teams, talent acquisition teams, business leaders, a little bit more flexibility in shaping right, uh, teams and the business on an ongoing basis. Right? So for, for me, it's a bit of a trade-off, but also complementary strategies. Uh, there is no right or wrong. Right? Both of them are important for a company, uh, but uh, having a kind of a regular check-in, so which one is working best and which one needs to be prioritized, I think is absolutely critical to try to get it as right as possible. I think the conversation that TA leaders needs to have with the business leaders, right? Um, is what are the drivers for the current slowdown, uh, right? And we've known about, by the way, the drivers for talent shortage for a while now, right? And some of the drivers for the current slowdown is actually structural nature. So for example, demographics, that's structural, right? Mass retirement of baby boomers, and we simply don't have enough pipeline of talent to backfill. That's structural. So these are drivers which are structural and they're not going away in three to six months. They are here for next four to five years. And if these structural drivers, right, have contributed to your talent shortage in the last four to five years, what makes you think that just because there is an economic slowdown right now, the talent shortage will just disappear, right? So you still need as a business to retain and hold on to the talent that you've been able to hire in the last one or two years. Yes, I understand that as businesses, we need to keep our revenue in pace with our expense, surely. But I think this is where uh, a conversation is required. And I'm saying it's easier said than done, but again, at least I can try this and try to put that in perspective. So the, you know, so the, the, the conversation I think the TA needs to tell the business people is that, look, you've got few people. These are excellent talent, unless, you think that the current economic slowdown is going to last for four or five years, then you may need to take perhaps a, you know, a difficult decision. But is there a way for you to retain these guys, right, uh, while still reducing your cost? And there are ways of it, by the way. You can work with an external consultant. This is one of the things that we actually do is to basically take excess capacity from an external organization and, you know, sort of run it as our run it as our employees, as an external workforce, well, where, you know, benefits can be sort of minimized, but we give them the flexibility that tomorrow, if there is a, you know, a cycle which resumes, you can take those people back. So, you know, so, so again, I sort of go back to the fact is that you don't want to let go of the talent that you have just because you have a certain transient economic slowdown. Because you're saying that just because of the current transient nuance, right, we should not let go of the talent. The topic was retaining is the new recruiting. Sergio said that in what worked for culture last year may not work this year. So right. the question I think everybody is looking for an answer to is what will work for retention in November or December 2022 and here off? Like what will work for retaining employees now? So are there any unique initiatives uh, any tips on what will work for retention right now? So, you know, Tanmay, for my business, retention has always been the same as recruiting, right? Because, uh, in fact, it's it's much more important now than ever. Because I'm in a business where majority of the people that are hired are billable headcounts. So I derive revenues from them. I think some of the initiatives, uh, and I don't know whether I can call them unique because, you know, by now they're quite obvious to us and they have been obvious to us for some time right now. But few few initiatives that we did was, you know, we introduced a subsidized uh, upskilling and training framework, uh, right? And we gave it away to to our associates, the external workforce, you know, at about 30, 40 percent uh, discount. We partnered with online course provider and, and they have tie-ups with, you know, Ivy League universities like the Harvard, Cambridge, MIT, Sloane, Columbia Business School, et cetera, et cetera. So we made these courses available to them at a heavy discount. Um, we automated our employee engagement process, uh, you know, by by rolling out an app uh, that we use to communicate with our employees. Uh, and through this app, we basically, you know, we try to sort of push uh, dining vouchers, retail vouchers, and and any uh, any sessions or a mental well-being sessions, for example, that we may be conducting from time to time. We're also actually in the process of automating large part of a back-end process, so that 
my HR ops rather get more free time to, you know, build rapport with individual employees. By the way, in my business, 80% of the employee experience comes from the client that they work with, right? And usually those clients are sort of thousand miles away from us. So we need obviously our associates input as well. And, and of course, to help us do that, we, you know, we partnered with Infido in, and, and using, you know, your Amber platform very proactively to check on our tenure employees, uh, just to detect, if you can detect a little bit early, if they're not happy, somebody wants to resign, what is it we can do to stop? Um, if, if they have an issue with the customer, then can we just go and, and discuss it confidentially in a sensitive manner with our customers as well? And I think finally, the, the last thing, and, and it's something that, that we are basically working on, which is, which is actually helping our employees with high cost of living, right? Uh, uh, by trying to bring in some form of inflation allowance. So these are, I think, some of the things that we've decided to do to retain and improve our employee experience. That that one on inflation allowance is is admirable. So thanks, Vikas. Sergio, you have any any tips, any initiatives? There's this particular data point that always resonates with me, that 70% of the weight right, of a decision-making process for an employee to stay or leave company comes from whether they are feeling cared by their line manager or not. So the experience that employee has in the relationship with the line manager or the ability of the line manager to lead them and manage them has an outsized influence on whether a, an employee decides to leave or stay. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so many of the initiatives that I have put in place is to support people managers to become better people managers, to give them more mechanisms, more tools, more frameworks, more support to lead people better, because that can actually amplify the effect right, of, a, of that particular retention strategy, making sure that people feel cared for. Um, and the second one is something that is very important for me as well, right? That a lot of research shows that ultimately, right, people want to feel fulfilled. That they need to have a sense that they're having an, some kind of impact. For me, it's very important for line managers to understand how people feel fulfilled, how their people uh, find their purpose, right, and what they like to do, and give also the employees, but also the line managers, an ability to not just identify that, but provide opportunities uh, in their teams within the company to help people find a purpose and find fulfillment in the job, right? We're seeing some very interesting questions pop up. So, Behram Sabawala has asked uh, uh, a very nuanced question, right? I'm going to read it out for everybody. Is there a tipping point between too little and too much? We have an interesting emerging situation where people who have left us have left their next job very quickly too because they believe the culture where they went was not great and issues like mental health surfaced very quickly there. So is there an overkill possible here where you also end up as being too nice, the other extreme, too nice as an employer to detriment like everyone involved? And I think ultimately a culture is a culture, right? And those people that maybe go to other places Ultimately, it's about whether they feel comfortable right, in the, in the new culture and they feel integrated with it. And a big job of many leaders is to ensure that that integration happens. Right? But it's also important for employees that go to other places to do their self-check-ins and figuring out if the new culture for them is a place where they can succeed and they can feel fulfilled and they can find a purpose right, that drives them uh, for the next stage in their in their career. Can you be too nice? Sure. Can you be too rough? Absolutely. Uh, but the reality is something that works today in terms of culture or approach or behaviors may not work next month. A company is not an isolated entity. A company gets uh, influenced negatively and positively by what's going on in the market, what the competitors are doing, right? What type of people join the company, what type of people leave the company. I've done some uh, previous work on companies and teams as systems, right? And it is fascinating to see how the different influences play a role in, in shaping up cultures and shaping up the, the type of people that succeed or 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 maybe fail in, in some cases. First, I'm going to start asking some of my favorite questions. Because uh-huh. You know what's coming your way. So, Sergio, what's something you believe in that almost everybody else disagrees with? I have, I have two answers for you. One of them is in jest, the other one more serious. The first one in jest is that there is only one right way of recording videos on a mobile phone, landscape <laughs> mode. <laughs> Vertical videos should be banned. 
that is half in jest. Uh, <laughs> I think the other one is a little bit more serious, right? Because I, and I got this from reading a couple of really good books last year. Um, and I think it comes down to uh, no matter how good you are, you're still replaceable. And for me, that was almost an epiphany. It relieves so much pressure in trying to live up to expectations. Knowing that you are, you're just as good as you are and you can create the right amount of impact, right? But you're not trying to live up to expectations. You don't have to live up to expectations of everybody else. In many cases, those could be contradictory, right? And you can make everyone happy. Wow. Interesting. And Vikas, what about you? What's something you believe in that most other people disagree with? Sure. Um, actually, there are quite a few things, yeah? But I'm going to follow Sergio's script and just going to name you two very quickly. The first thing is most people think that leadership is a natural trait, right? That you're born as a leader. and and honestly, I've never believed in that. I mean, I think just like all other things, you are shaped by your experience and therefore you can learn along the way to be a good leader. And really, if you happen to be lucky to, go, to have good mentors and role models in your life that were really kind enough to spend time with you and teach you, you know, some nuggets of leadership, you can learn and grow to be a leader. The second is, is a personal. Uh, Ray Kroc of McDonald's said famously, luck is a dividend of sweat. So harder you work, luckier you get. But the way I define luck is actually opportunities. So luckier people get more opportunities in life to grab something special than others, right? Now, what you do of that opportunity and whether you're able to capitalize on that opportunity depends on your maturity and hard work. So I would, I would really tweak the saying, success is a dividend of sweat. So harder you work, more successful you get. But for opportunities to come your way, you need luck. And for that, stars need to be aligned. So... We have a few hundred folks on this call combined across Zoom and LinkedIn, and most of them are HR leaders. What would you like to say as a closing remark to hundreds of people leaders? So my message to you know all, uh, all the leaders would be is that please look at the recomposition of your workforce. And, and I think, think hard about what skills are core to you and what skills are not. I mean, what strategies core to your business and, and what is not. Don't build capacity, assuming demand environment. Let's not try to do things in-house for which you don't see a visibility for at least three to four years. Uh, again, take advantage of flexible workforce. It might seem like I'm advocating my industry, but I think there is a lot of merit in taking help from a staffing company to engage talents on a contingent basis. I mean, engaging contingent talent does give you access to top quality talents, but at the same time, it does give you flexibility as well to you know, flex up and flex down. And really, unlike, unlike flexing down when you're getting rid of your own perm employees, you can flex down contingent staff and it does not come with a reputational damage. Focus on culture, value and employee experience, particularly at the sensitive time. I think culture will beat salaries when people come out of the cycle. Culture won't be defined as bean bags, free lunches, and sleeping pots. Culture would be defined as whether there is an empathy to the external environment. Culture would be there when companies would treat shareholders with the same level of importance as stakeholders, you know, which are employees. Got it. Thank you so much, Vikas. Sergio, anything you'd um, like to share? Two things. Number one, um, in our businesses, the main pressure tends to be on the numbers and performing. But ultimately, everything is about people. Any decisions that you make about your business, put the people lens in front of it and everything will flow after that. Secondly, no matter what we do and no matter how hopeful we can be, there is always going to be one crisis or another happening at any given time. Don't waste the crisis, make good decisions and look at the opportunities that the, that the crisis provides you. That's it. Fantastic. Thanks, Vikas. Thanks, Sergio. Thanks, everybody, for making time today. And I hope you had a lot of takeaways from today's session. 